Do you have endometriosis? What are the signs and symptoms you should look out for? Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I'm a fertility doctor, and this channel exists to talk to you about your body and your fertility so that you can become a better advocate for your own health and just understand how your body works. Today, I'm talking all about endometriosis, warning signs, symptoms, what it is I want you to know about this disease. If you like learning about your body and your fertility, please subscribe to the channel. That way we can spread more health-related content and information to more people. Well, first of all, what is endometriosis? Endometriosis is where endometrial glands and stromus, the tissue of the endometrium, which is generally what we think of as our period, you shed off some of that endometrium. So that same type of tissue that you see in your period is actually found outside the body. And what we mean by that is it can be found in locations outside, usually in what we call the peritoneal cavity. It can be on the peritoneum, underneath or on the uterus, on the bowels, the bladder, it can be on the ovaries, and that tissue is hormonally responsive, just like the endometrium is. If we think about what the endometrium does, it grows in response to estrogen. So if we think about every month, a group of eggs comes out of that vault inside the ovary, each egg grows inside a follicle, the brain sends out follicle stimulating hormone, or FSH, which works to grow an egg. As that egg grows, it makes estrogen. That estrogen is growing the lining of the uterus to prepare it for an implantation. And so the endometrium is hormonally responsive and grows in response to estrogen. After ovulation occurs, the corpus luteum or the follicle starts to make progesterone. Progesterone stabilizes the endometrium, stops it from growing, and inside the uterus, it opens and closes the implantation window. So we know that an embryo can implant only after a certain amount of exposure to progesterone. So overall, endometriosis is endometrial tissue outside the uterus, and it still is hormonally responsive, just like the endometrium is, which for the most part means grows in response to estrogen and stabilizes in response to progesterone. Are there risk factors to getting endometriosis? For the most part, we don't really know 100% what causes endometriosis. There is likely a genetic and then also some environmental contribution. If you have a first degree family member who has endometriosis, like a mom or a sister, you have a seven to 10 times higher chance of having the disease. So there's absolutely some genetic component. I always view endometriosis as on the spectrum of an autoimmune disease, meaning your body is responding abnormally to one of your tissues. And then that abnormal response of inflammation and attack is causing that endometrial tissue to grow into that peritoneal environment and then create this hostile environment with lots of inflammation. So it has some autoimmune tendencies, it has some genetic tendencies, and then there's some environmental factors, likely things that you are exposed to that might make you at greater risk. One other interesting fact is that if you have a uterine birth defect called a Mullerian anomaly or any type of obstruction, so if you had a septum that went horizontally and prohibited menstrual blood from coming out, then some of that menstrual blood and that endometrium will go out the fallopian tubes. And that does put you at a higher risk of developing endometriosis if you have an obstructive Mullerian anomaly. Overall, what we know is that endometriosis is relatively common. We usually quote that one out of 10 people are going to get endometriosis. However, that number is probably very much underdiagnosed because the only way to officially get that diagnosis and get into that club is to have surgery. Currently, endometriosis is diagnosed officially only by surgery. So putting a camera in the abdomen, looking around, seeing endometrial tissue or implants. They often look dark or white, they're vascular. You can have cysts on the ovaries and excising them and sending them off for a pathological diagnosis, meaning you send a biopsy sample off to the lab and they look and they say, yes, those are endometrial glands or stroma. That's how you get the official diagnosis. That limits our ability to tell how many people have endometriosis. And we know from selective studies like of infertility patients that almost up to 50% of people who seek care for infertility have endometriosis, whether it's mild or severe, there's some endometriosis. So most of us like myself think that it's vastly underdiagnosed. Just because surgery is the only way to get the official diagnosis does not mean that many more people don't have it or that you can't get an idea that you might have it. So if we think about other ways to diagnose the disease, 
One is historically, just because you have a really good history. So classically, endometriosis symptoms, although you can have no symptoms at all, I have had patients who have that, but most people have painful periods. So endometriosis alone does not cause irregular periods, although you could have two things going on, but endometriosis can cause painful periods. But what is painful? If you've had endo and all your periods are painful, how do you know this isn't just normal? Typically, I say if your periods prohibit you from living your normal life. So if they are debilitating, if you can't participate in normal sports, if you'd cancel dinner plans, if you'd call in sick to work, that's not normal. If you have to take narcotic pain medication or you lie on the floor, that's not normal. Another thing can be GI or bowel changes on your period like diarrhea, constipation, bloating, vomiting, not normal. And if you have pain with intercourse, then that's another warning sign. So overall, Endo, because of those implants and some of the inflammation, can cause a variety of pain or abnormal environment inside the peritoneum. Those contribute to most of the symptoms. Endometriosis, as I said earlier, can also contribute to infertility. So sometimes the presenting symptom is actually none of the other things, but that you're having difficulty getting pregnant. Endometriosis is on a spectrum. We stage the disease based on the severity of the implants or the lesions. So mild, moderate, severe. And severe disease is gonna have severe anatomical distortion or endometriomas inside the ovary. This can contribute to a variety of different ways that it impacts infertility. So obviously if you have anatomical distortion like fallopian tube blockage, that's gonna prohibit egg and sperm from meeting and make it hard for you to get pregnant. However, other ways it can contribute is from having a high inflammatory environment. And this is why even at a mild or a moderate stage of disease, where maybe you don't have anatomic distortion, you might also have really bad symptoms or you can contribute to infertility. And studies have shown that because the fallopian tubes are open to the peritoneum, and that's where the endometrial implants are, that that inflammatory or toxic environment can actually damage the sperm, and it can also impair fertilization or early embryo development. So that environment is a huge component of why people with endometriosis also have infertility, even if their fallopian tubes are open. So just because you might get a test and your tubes are open, doesn't mean that your endometriosis is not contributing to your fertility. Also, if you do develop an endometrioma, this is an endometriosis cyst within the ovary, that can decrease your ovarian reserve or the amount of eggs that you have. Endometriosis is one of the few things that we know that actually does drop your egg count, similarly to like smoking cigarettes or chemotherapy. And so when we know somebody has endometriosis and maybe you got diagnosed really young, we wanna have a good plan to talk about for your fertility later. Maybe that means freezing eggs, trying to get pregnant earlier, following your ovarian reserve. And if you've had multiple surgeries on your ovaries to take out these cysts, we do get more and more worried about what your ovarian reserve will be when you're ready to get pregnant. Now, even though surgery is the only official way to diagnose this right now, there are some other things in the works and some other suggestive features. So one is that you can see endometriomas on ultrasound, those cysts inside the ovaries, they have a very distinct appearance. Another is sometimes you can see distortion of anatomy on ultrasound and with appropriate symptoms, I would might say, this is presumed endometriosis. We may or may not do surgery depending on our goals or what we're trying to achieve. Also on exam. So when you go to the doctor and you get a pap smear, you've also noticed that your doctor is also going to do what we call a bimanual exam. This is where they feel your ovaries and your uterus with their hands. And the point of this is to check for abnormal positioning, hardness, nodules, and some of those can be very specific to endometriosis. There's newer tests like looking at BCL6, which is a marker you can get in the endometrial tissue. Studies have shown that the endometrium that has high BCL6 has a higher probability of having endometriosis outside the body. So that's an endometrial biopsy test that's currently being studied. And then also sometimes you can have a blood marker, CA125, which is really a cancer marker, but it's also an inflammatory marker and maybe mildly elevated in endometriosis. But for the most part, we go on symptoms, history, and physical exam as what we're guiding. And if we have a high index of suspicion or you have a lot of pain or symptoms, you might go forward with surgery to try to get to the root cause. Overall, I think it's very important to understand that you did nothing to cause your endometriosis and that how you manage it is going to be very different based on the stage of life where you are. Trying to decrease inflammation with lifestyle modifications can certainly be helpful. And that's why you'll hear people talk about certain dietary approaches, things that are going to decrease autoimmunity or decrease inflammation because you can't go and just change your environment. 
Sometimes surgery is indicated, but sometimes surgery is not. So taking out an endometrioma inside the ovary may drop your egg count, and that's not always the approach I do if we're going on with IVF. Although if you have a lot of pain, it might be the perfect thing for this moment. Natural fertility can improve after surgery, but usually endo can come back. And so if you are having surgery, but you're not ready to get pregnant, trying to think about other ways that you can prevent the disease from growing. And this is where sometimes hormonal options can be something to talk about. Even though the birth control pill is relatively cheap and easy, it's not for everybody and it has its own side effects. It does not regress endometriosis at all. So you'll hear people say it doesn't treat it. It potentially can suppress it, meaning you are taking a daily progestin, and so that's different than having unopposed estrogen that your body normally makes. But often progestin-based treatments can be more effective or medications that block the brain from even sending out FSH so that you don't make any estrogen. The treatment should be personalized. If you're going to have surgery, it should be with somebody who really understands endometriosis surgery and what are your goals. Are you trying to get pregnant or are you trying to get your pain better? They are both appropriate goals, but whoever is managing your endo should know if you want to have children in the future and what that looks like. One last thing to say is that if you have pain as a teenager, that is highly specific to having endometriosis. So debilitating period pain when you are young has a very high probability of meaning you have endometriosis. Very often people will put you on birth control pills because it is an easier way to manage the period cramps. If you tolerate the pill fine, you are not hurting your fertility. And a very good study showed that with prolonged pill usage of 10 years or more, you not only decrease your chance of ovarian cancer, you actually had improved fertility compared to other people who were trying to get pregnant at your same age who had not used the pill. And the hypothesis was because it was preventing some endometriosis from progressing in a large portion of those patients. So I want you to make sure that you're not listening to a lot of the rhetoric out there about this is bad or this is good. You need a doctor who's gonna care about you, care about your goals now and in the future, talk you through all the treatment options. But the take home message is that having endometriosis is real. Endometriosis is common and it is understudied. But if you have pain with your periods, GI changes with your periods, if you're having pain with intercourse, if this pain is impacting your life, it is definitely not normal. And I really hope that you can seek somebody and advocate for yourself to get an evaluation to try to figure out what is going on. As always, I hope this has been helpful for you. Please leave any comments that you have or questions in the comments. I'm gonna be doing a follow-up video on treatment options if you're trying to get pregnant with endometriosis and please ask those questions below when we can include them in. As always, you can get more information on the As Woman podcast or follow along on Instagram. Thanks.